Ethereum created the ERC20 saying, if you want to create your own token, give it a name, give it a decimal point, put some information around it, you can, and it runs on top of Ethereum, just like those tokens run on top of uh, the arcade uh, system there. And then you can use it within whatever project that you are building there. Welcome back to another episode of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia falco your host. 2020 is almost at a close. The pandemic's still raging, but one thing also raging, and that is investors. Investors continued to invest this year. Pandemic, no pandemic. U.S. elections, no U.S. elections. We had the Dow hitting over 30,000. We had tech stocks rallying, even the oil market recovering from March lows. And, well, I don't want to mention the crypto space has been going crazy with the Bitcoin almost hitting 20,000 during the Thanksgiving week. But within that, there is another space that has been absolutely going wild. Actually, it's been created more or less this year, and that is the DeFi space, a.k.a. Decentralized finance, the opposite of CFI, centralized finance, or what we know as the traditional financial system. If I'm talking about it got absolutely crazy, is absolutely ballooning, if not exploding, look at this. Uh, in June this year, there was about one billion US dollars locked into the DeFi space. Now it's over 10 billion. And the transactional value has increased uh, from the second quarter to the, to the third quarter of this year tenfold, hitting over 123 billion US dollars. What is DeFi? What is happening there? What is, what is it all about right now? And what does it mean for our future? And this is why I invited Dr. Adele El-Misiri. He's an absolute expert. He's the CEO and co-founder of AlphaFin. He joins us here on Mentory TV to drill deep into something that I'm totally curious about, Adele, and I think everybody should really prick their ears about. Thanks so much for joining us here. Uh, well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Um, and I love being here. So, vielen Dank. Um, and Auf Deutsch, auf Deutsch, sehr schön. <laughs> ja, ich spreche Deutsch auch. Ich habe äh, Deutsch studiert am guten Institut und ich habe äh, studiert am Stuttgart. In Stuttgart, uh, this is around yeah. the corner, about 200 kilometers where I sit. Amazing. Well, you know what? I don't want to translate the entire interview, Adele, so let's keep it in English. And yes. chapeau in French that you do speak German, and Stuttgart is a great place, I can tell you. And you can tell me, I think, better. Um, let's start our conversation, Adele, if I may, with you know, DeFi, decentralized finance, and, and the link to blockchain. Let's yes. start at the beginning because a lot of our community, they're not really familiar with DeFi or even blockchain. So um, blockchain has been the uh, uh, story of my life. I was uh, um, doing my PhD in uh, what was called then the trust networks. It's basically a way to trust some sort of transactions happening on the network and my last paper in that field was in 2010. That's exactly around the corner from when Satoshi came up with the blockchain concept around that. The blockchain in its essence allows you to do uh, one very important uh, breakthrough, which is taking a digital asset, creating a digital asset. It's a big difference between a digital asset and a digital file. Why is that? A file you can copy, a file you cannot really own or have position of, but a digital asset you can. So you can own a digital asset and you cannot copy it or send two versions of it to, to different people. That's the double spend problem that we uh, have in computer science. So once we've created that, that uh, basically exploded on the scene that you can create something digitally, finally, and you can trade it and you work with it. And that led to uh, Bitcoin. Um, just a few uh, years afterwards, all the uh, people working in the space were thinking about like Bitcoin is so difficult to work with. One of those guys was Vitalik Buterin, and he wanted to be able of programming it to do something more useful. And hence started with uh, Ethereum that allowed you to actually program that. So now we don't only have those digital assets, but you can actually program and create something uh, on top of those. That led us to the ICO era 
where people went into creating a whole plethora of things. We have uh, 4,000, 5,000 different uh, uh, tokens that have been created and 99% of them don't serve a, a real purpose uh, there. But it was a, a big, huge experiment. That was the first wave. So since then, we have a second wave. That second wave that came in called uh, uh, DeFi. DeFi is basically applying the same banking uh, instruments on top of those digital assets. So when, when we have a digital asset, you could not really deposit it, borrow against it, or earn interest on it. Now with DeFi, you are able to do that. That's why all this creates. And it's very really funny that both waves, the first one started with financial crisis, the second one with a pandemic. So I don't know if there's a relation. Yeah, there's always a crisis and creation moment. But um, Adele, I think um, with the first wave really creating the ICO craze where, you know, you had the blockchain protocol and for the first time you had digital assets. And now these digital assets are moving on thanks to Ethereum. And I think Ethereum 2.0 is coming out on the 1st of December, 2020. And so it's programmable. And what DeFi actually tries to do is it tries to replicate all the financial instruments and products that we know from our normal banking activity, as you were just saying, lending or investing or, or depositing even and sending money around, right? Yes, that's correct. So uh, today there are many protocols out there that allows you to take your, your digital assets. Before, before DeFi, you had only like a Bitcoin. What are you going to do with it? Just hold it, right? That's it, or use it for payment. In DeFi, now you can deposit in a protocol, and the protocol will utilize it so that it gives you a yield back. So then you can get some interest back on that. Not only this, but you can also participate in all different uh, types of exotic instruments that are built on those uh, mechanisms. That's really the power of DeFi. The second wave is you can deposit, you can create certificates, you can earn money, you can support things through all of that stuff. But kind of like in my mind, the focus also here is how can we create the biggest profit out of this? While we need to think about how do you create the biggest impact in society in general? Let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance and let's get back to the conversation. We'll get to that, what you do specifically with AlphaFin, Adele, in a moment. But let's just quickly try to wrap our minds around DeFi, because one important part, apart from in encryption um, and the blockchain itself, in DeFi are smart contracts. Now, smart contracts are something that are fundamental to the efficiency and fastness and the trust issue you were mentioning at the beginning of what you were saying. Tell us a little bit about what smart contracts are and how they function. Uh, that's a really good question because that marks the difference between uh, Bitcoin in general and what Ethereum is doing. So you will be surprised to know that smart contracts are not smart and they are not contracts by the legal definition anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so they're everything they don't say to be or that they say to be, I mean. Yes. So, uh, uh, and uh, that was a great topic of discussion at uh, MIT in a big conference there around like, why do we call them that way? And the, uh, the smart contracts in essence are simply a code, a piece of code that you can interact with. And uh, usually they are uh, uh, dormant, meaning they are not active. You have to invoke something to make them uh, work and operate. Um, the reason that they are also called a contract is because they actually create a binding effect. Because on blockchain, when you transact, it's uh, irreversible. So if I sent you uh, uh, Ethereum, I cannot go back and take that Ethereum back from you. So then it, 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 an issue arises from there. It's just transactional, but we want to expand it to where we can do some more beneficial things, right? Exactly, something and, circular, right. Mm -hmm. So an example of that is like we're talking here. So you could create a, a smart contact, a code that says, okay, we start the show and every minute I'm talking with you, you send me an Ethereum uh, through that contract. So by engaging with that contract, as we are talking right here, I am automatically executing on those because we both participated in that contract. So that's a very beneficial uh, aspect of it. During the ICO era, what people would do is 
I would create something like Adele token, which by the way, there is a company that created Adele token. I'm very happy about that. So I'm, I'm actually in blockchain. So, and then what you do is uh, create a contract saying, if you send uh, one Ethereum, you get a thousand Adele's. And that becomes a contract between the two parties and you can execute on that. That's the simplest form. Then we get into... Yeah, and then we can get into more complex ones. Yeah, exactly. And before we go into that, I think what is interesting here is exactly what you say, this kind of binary relationship, which makes it smart because the contract is automated. If something, something happens, then something, something will be the answer. And I prepared um, a screenshot, actually, um, for uh, you and our viewers, if I may, if I may share it with sure. you. Um, where is it here, which explains uh, quite nicely with the concept of a vending machine, um, the, you know, the smart contract. So what you have is here a vending machine in the middle. And if uh, you want to buy a, a can of whatever drink without naming any, any brands, and it costs $3, you put one in, then if $1, then machine, no Coke. If you put in $3, then machine will give you a can of Coke. If you put in own, uh, more than $3, like say $4, then it will give you something in return, right? That's yeah. very simple. That's a smart contract. Yes. Without so, human interference. I think this is, this is I think, the, the most important part about it, that the human error would not happen necessarily here. Yes. And, and you've touched on a couple uh, of really, really important points here. So um, I, I like your, your uh, uh, naming there of automated code. So that's what it should have been named, like automated code, but like smart contracts is much like, easier to say. Nick Sabo. Nick yes. Sabo. He thought it was sexy, I guess. <laughs> so, so in your example there, that's a simple one. You give me something and you take something out there. However, Let's now uh, consider the possibilities. That vending machine is actually owned by someone that put it out there. The Coke in the machine there or drinks are basically uh, supplied by another supplier uh, in it. And then the company also supplied all of the stuff. In today's world, you would have to pay for the machine yourself and provide the financing and then provide the financing for the drinks and all of the stuff there. And... Uh, in a smart contract world, in a blockchain, all of that stuff can execute. So you could agree with the, uh, with the uh, uh, owner of the vending machine that they get 10% profit and the supplier gets 5% profit. The company gets this much out of that. And because everything is encoded, then as soon as the consumer buys one drink, everything executes. So now we've multiplied that by 10 folds around the different players in the ecosystem. Yeah, and that's exactly. power. Yeah, and I, I think this is exactly the smartness of it, um, because you do not have this. I mean, the automation always means that there is no human potential uh, margin of error. Of course, the smart contract needs to be programmed at the beginning, and these kind of rules need to be set up. But once it's established, everything basically is automated and scalable and quite transparent, which brings me to the next question, Adele. What are the main features of DeFi compared to CeFi? That's an existential question. Let me tell you why. So um, uh, the current financial uh, system is, is great and fantastic. It served us uh, well for hundreds of years, but the technology of which was invented in the Demichi era. So uh, if you are familiar with like how the monetary system uh, evolved, we first had bartering. So I would uh, uh, give you like uh, bread and you'd give me chickens. However, I cannot store chickens. Uh, they actually die. So uh, uh, <laughs> Have a shelf life, yeah. <laughs> yes. So then life. people started inventing actual value storage, gold, silver, and supported by some sort of a government to assure the accuracy of which. But you still had a problem when you try to move from one place to the other. You can't like simply take all your bags of gold with you because you're going to get robbed in the, in the way. That's where the banking system started. And uh, the bank in Venice would give you a note. And they would say like, this is a bank note to the other branch in uh, Marseille saying, okay, give this guy a bag of gold. 
So the term banknote was actually invented back then in the, the Michi era, and it's still used. Like if you go to uh, Africa and, and uh, France, banknote means money. So, so then uh, that system worked well, but it required all of those technologies around them using SWIFT to send money from one place to the other. I pay 45 bucks to, tra to uh, transfer a wire, and it takes three days to arrive to you. So all of those technologies are very hard to uh, implement and, and use faster. In our current global economy, now you have to have a lot of transactions happening, and it's very, very hard to do that on uh, rails and technologies that were used and invented way back uh, then. So that's where uh, DeFi comes in uh, as comparable to the CFI. In the essence of DeFi, is that peer-to-peer -peer transactions. In a CFI, I have to send my money through a bank with a bank account. The bank takes it to another bank, to another bank, to another bank, until it goes to you, your account there. All of those have inefficiencies. It also have fees associated with them. So we can't really get the benefits. It's like a, a tax on top of what we are doing. Yep. But with, with uh, DeFi, it's direct transaction, yep. cutting off all of that inefficiencies, hence providing you with the highest value possible. Exactly, the highest value, lowest costs, and yep. of course, the transaction time is really, really important. And one of the things that is really upsetting, even though it got better, is the settlement, you know, everything yes. that is in the background, even now with the AH system, uh, yes. ACH system, it still takes two or three days nowadays to settle, whereas using DeFi, it is immediate it is everywhere at the same time um, and the whole thing about decentralized you know if somebody thinks okay if something is central there's somebody that governs something you know uh, because machines can go wrong and i wonder whether this automation when you don't know who can pull the plug if things go wrong actually really creates the trust that DeFi says it does compared to all the upsets all the disappointments we've seen in all the financial crises ever since, you know, finance yes. exists in banks. Yes. So that also is a great point to uh, think about. So governance is a, a great issue. And uh, you need to think about like how um, governance systems evolved over the history. And uh, with, with, when it is like more local, you have to have a tight governance. But when it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, you need to create what I call a loose governance system that allows people to transact peer-to-peer, -peer, much easier uh, in there. So uh, the nice thing about blockchain is all of those transactions are done on nodes. The nodes are uh, spread all over. So Ethereum, for example, has tens of thousands of nodes all across the globe, allowing uh, all of that to have redundancy. So you cannot have like one entity taking down. In a banking system, if the bank servers are down, you, you cannot transact. You have to wait until they recover. But in a, a blockchain, the, that, that uh, ledger is replicated 10,000 times all over the globe uh, there. That also makes it harder for one jurisdiction to stop because it is already sent out within minutes, like 10 minutes max, it's already across the globe. So now all of those transactions are there. So you cannot really modify it, stop it. It's uh, immutable in that sense as well. Settlement is a, another important point where you can settle your transaction quickly. So sometimes you, you assume, okay, I'm going to give you the goods and I'm going to get the money and then uh, to be surprised that, hey, your, your uh, deposit bounced back. So then there is no finality, as we call in the settlement there. However, with blockchain, there is. So once you get it in your wallet, you actually have it there. That leads us to the point of how do you control your funds? So you'd be surprised that when you deposit your money in a bank, you don't really own your money. The fine print says the bank owns the money and they may or may not give you back your money based on the bank's policy, all of that stuff in there. That's legally binding there. In blockchain, if you own your keys, you own your money, the actual assets. And that's a big a switch and we we could not do that in a banking system before because the technology was not allowing us to do that in blockchain the technology allows us to have that direct ownership now there is a, a side effect of that if you lose your keys you lose your money there is no recovery process so you have to keep all your phrase all of that stuff with you sounds scary at the beginning 
But then so are many other things, like, for example, your laptop. If you don't know your password to it, you cannot get into it, your phone, all of those pieces there. So that's uh, just a side effect of our digital economy and digital world there. Systemic risk. I was just uh, listening to you, Adele. I'm just thinking, okay, if something goes wrong there, you know, within 10 minutes, it's basically everywhere on the, on the ledger distributed. Um, 96% of DeFi runs on Ethereum, as far as I understand. Is there a same systemic risk to the DeFi system as it is, as we've seen in the traditional financial world? It's, it's much less. The reason there uh, is the transparency. So most of DeFi, just because it's blockchain, and uh, in, in blockchain, you have to involve your community in what you are trying to do. So first thing that uh, people usually have is they publish the code, like the system, like uh, when was the last time you actually were able to go into a bank and inspecting their vault systems, their security and all of that stuff? Never. But in uh, uh, blockchain, especially in DeFi, all of those are published and people look at them and they are transparent. So even the contracts of them are published and transparent. And if you don't publish them, people will not trust you. So people don't invest in block boxes. They usually want to see the code, understand there are no back holes, all of the stuff. So having said so, that's not 100%. Nothing in life is 100%. So there are those uh, risks. Some of those risks are bugs that you have not accounted for. That happens. Things like uh, the uh, network speed. So uh, they, it varies. So you cannot really depend. But there's on. congestion risk, right? I mean, if, if everything is going through Ethereum right now, even though 2.0 is around the corner, corner, I think with this kind of volume that DeFi has seen in the last few months, congestion yes. might be an issue, right? Yes, and not only by DeFi. So a couple of years ago, there was the very first game developed on uh, Ethereum uh, called CryptoKitties. And that basically created a congestion on the entire system, almost froze it up for a couple of minutes uh, there. So any, any of that uh, wider adoption, it's the pains of making it wider. So it's like growing uh, bigger and bigger, and that's what you would see there. So uh, that congestion is an issue. The uh, other issue are uh, s sometimes that the system, when you are trying to uh, work with it, if you don't understand how it is going to work, like there is not a lot of user-friendly uh, UI, which I kind of like always preach in, in blockchain is you have to make your user interface simple enough. Otherwise, only those in the community will actually read about it or use it. Yes. So why are we doing it that way? We need to make it simple. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned that, you know, the first bug, which I also have is, okay, I need my keys to have my wallet and just to establish a wallet and then have different wallets for different coins and different keys. I'm like, all right, this is not plug and play yet. I leave that to the experts. But this is exactly where, you know, you need to stay with it. And the user experience, as with every nascent technology, is something that needs to happen in order to make it more uh, a commodity rather than something yes. that, you know, is very special and limited to, to specialized people. Let's move on from that. And let's have a look at the actual applications. We already mentioned lending or investing in general and the potential conversions of all your assets and managing them uh, thanks to DeFi, but also coins. You mentioned that within the first wave as well. So we have coins and we have stable coins. Can you kind of mention a little bit the difference between the two? Because both exist and a lot of people might not necessarily know what sort of institutions and companies already have their own coins out there. Yes, that's also a phenomenal uh, question. And there are two different things that we want to uh, talk about. First, I want to explain one thing about fungible and non-fungible tokens. So, um, and I'm not going to bore everybody with like the FINMA explanation of all of this stuff. And no maybe... lingo, no lingo. Okay, we need to keep this on the spot, yeah. high Sweet. level, so, but simple enough. <laughs> so fungible means it's just like a dollar bill. Like it's, it's everything is interchangeable. It has a certain value. You can use it, all of that. Non-fungible are things like your baseball cards or your collectibles, if you have a painting by uh, Picasso or Rembrandt or something like that, that's, that has value, but it's not fungible. And two different paintings are not interchangeable between them. That's a, a main definition that we need to keep in our mind. Then from there, 
when Bitcoin was created and uh, then Ethereum was created, uh, those were the only two big tokens. And out of Bitcoin, there was another one called Litecoin that uh, forked Bitcoin to create a very simple version that is faster and cheaper to work with. But there, in order for you to create a, a, a coin, a, a token, you needed to create all that infrastructure in the system and take the whole code there. So Ethereum created something called ERC-20. ERC-20 is a standard that says, well, if you follow that standard, you could have your token on top of our token. And a good example of that is in, uh, in the US for, uh, and across the world, you have arcades, right? In the arcade, you go pay your fiat a token, so dollar, euro, something like that, and you get uh, small tokens there that you can use in your arcade machines, right? Mm -hmm. The only reason that that is possible because the arcade says, here are the rules and you can work with it. So similarly, Ethereum created that ERC-20 saying, if you want to create your own token, give it a name, give it a decimal point, put some information around it, you can, and it runs on top of Ethereum, just like those tokens run on top of uh, the arcade uh, system there. And then you can use it within whatever project that you are building there. So the example of a company creating its own token to use, they can use it for either operating their own services. So imagine a phone company, for example, going and saying, okay, here are our tokens. If you use those ones, you can prepay for your card, you can get discounts and so forth. So all of those mechanisms that you cannot really use if you pay in cash, mm -hmm. you can do it with tokens. And you can make it where... Um, you can get charged by the second. So you have a hundred tokens, you keep talking on the phone and takes down from there immediately and it is final immediately. So it shifts the concept of having a bill and settle the bill at the end of the month to like immediate um, settlement in there. Just like in an arcade where you have tokens, you have your own rules within your arcade that are different than outside. So a phone company might decide, okay, you, if you get a certain amount of tokens, your calls are cheaper or if you use your tokens at uh, this time, then you can get a better rate or these tokens, sub tokens of what I'm creating works in the EU, but uh, you have to get these to call internationally uh, out of there. So all of those are really interesting implementation that we could not really do with the normal uh, systems. So companies started minting their own tokens uh, in uh, uh, what led to the initial coin offering, that's what we call ICOs, similar to the IPO, initial public offering. And the big uh, uh, use case for it was we will create a system and that system will have a value down the road. And what we need for you to do is trust us, give us your Ethereum in exchange for these token, X token that I've just created. And I'll take the proceeds, I'll build the project and then the value of the token will appreciate and you've participated into uh, those. That had a couple of uh, side effects. One was regulatory in like, um, if you, are you filing as a utility token or an actual uh, funding token, or are you doing money transmission and, and so forth? That one of them. And the other thing is that uh, people that try to create the system did not perceive how to actually uh, progress so it created lots of risks for people, so it did not go as planned. That's why I usually refer to it. If you try to get something too good to be true, it probably is good to, good to be true. And that wraps up the first part of my conversation with Dr. Adele el about the DeFi space, a.k.a. decentralized finance. I hope you like what you've heard so far, and I hope you do enjoy my other conversations on Mentory TV. And if you do, why don't you join in and subscribe for free, of course. Hit the bell button as well so I can always keep you informed when I am about to release another fabulous conversation with a fabulous guest on Mentory TV.